This is the Garden of English. I'm Tim Freitas, and today we're going to continue our question three response by looking at how we can body paragraph effectively. So stick around and check it out. Okay, so we are back here looking at how to body paragraph for literary analysis. This is uh, going to work with AP Lit question three. It's also really kind of just how you provide literary analysis on any literary paper you're going to write. Um, and if you didn't check out the video that came before this, or the two videos that came before this, I gave one about how to break down a prompt, and I also had a video about how there's a pretty standard AP Lit thesis or literary analysis thesis that can work for your AP Lit exam question one, two, and three, and actually it can work in college and graduate school too, and I would know that because I used the basic template to uh, create my thesis statements in my graduate and undergraduate work. So uh, anyway, you could probably access those videos right up here. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to get right into it today uh, where we talk about body paragraphing because I'm going to assume that you have already watched the thesis uh, videos. If you have not, once again, you can just click on that little card there um, and take care of that. I want to remind you that we are looking at this uh, AP Lit Question 3 prompt from uh, back in 1982. And it talks about violence. So I'm going to just quickly reread this here as a little reminder, and we'll get right into things. So it says, In great literature, no scene of violence exists for its own sake. Either from your own reading or from the list below, choose a work of fiction in which the reader is confronted with a scene or scenes of violence. Then in a well-written essay, analyze how the scene or scenes contributes to an interpretation of the work as a whole. Do not merely summarize plot. Now, once again, in the last video, we talked about how we break, how we want to break this down and, and do those sorts of things. Um, and I also produced a thesis template, I mean, sorry, a thesis statement. And the book that I actually chose was Of Mice and Men. So if you haven't read Of Mice and Men, uh, please note that this is your spoiler alert right now because you're going to actually um, be exposed to some plot, of, uh, some plot elements and plot events that will indeed potentially ruin the ending when we look at our thesis uh, statements here that are going to drive our body paragraphs. Now... Uh, when we produced our thesis statements last time, I gave you two different options on how to produce them. Uh, thesis statements are basically like your essay in concentrated form. And so my two options here were thesis one um, was a hyper-concentrated thesis. And then thesis two, I kind of actually drew out the two body paragraphs I was going to write. Because in Of Mice and Men, there are two mercy killings. And I could either call them two mercy killings or I could call them, um, you know... Uh, the euthanizing of a pet, and the killing of a best friend. And I could keep them separate. And that's the only difference between these two thesis statements here. But if this is the thesis that's going to guide my essay uh, right here, what we're going to do is we're now going to produce the body paragraph. And if I'm using thesis two, my body paragraph number one is going to talk about the euthanizing of the pet and how it showcases the deep care that the character's uh, involved shared for one another and the euthanizing of the pet the characters would be candy and his dog um, so that's gonna be my first body paragraph if I were writing my second body paragraph if I were looking at thesis number two it talks about the purposeful killing of a friend at that point I would talk about George killing Lenny and how that showed the deep care that he had for Lenny um, but anyway, so once again, we have our thesis statements here. Like I said, I'm pretty sure that if you're watching this video, you watched the thesis statement video before, so you're familiar with what these thesis statements are. You could pause it, you can read it here. But this is what's driving our body paragraphs. So please note that I do actually have a template for a body paragraph. Um, and because these are templates, you can use these however you would like. You can move things around a little bit. Uh, but in the basic, the most basic structure of the template is this, okay? Every topic sentence has what literary element you're going to talk about and why the author actually puts it in the literature. So there's a what and there's a why. And then uh, after the topic sentence, you then have the evidence, which is where that what is found from the topic sentence. And then you have commentary, which explains how the evidence actually completes the why of the topic sentence. So um, I'm going to break that down for you here with my example, and then we'll actually look at the whole paragraph together, and we'll be done for today. So my topic sentence here, uh, the, the basic format for it is an ordering word or phrase, which I do have uh, for you at the bottom of this document. I'll just scroll down here real quick. I've got all of my essay templates here. Uh, you'll notice that I've got topic sentence stems for you that provide a little bit of variation, but um, I have ordering language here uh, that, that can help you if you want. But anyway, 
Uh, for the topic sentence, it's going to be an ordering word or phrase, the author's last name, a powerful verb, first literary element that's going to be taken down from the thesis, and then we have in order to, and then we have a why in the text. So what is this literary moment doing in the text, okay? And you'll notice that in mine, for my ordering word or phrase, it says at the beginning of the story, and then it says once the main characters arrive at their new jobs. Notice that I've got this little non-essential here offset by dashes. The reason why I do that for myself is because uh, that is an advanced writing technique. I encourage my kids to do that, to have little non-essentials offset by dashes. You don't need that. If I got rid of that information, the sentence would still make sense, okay? But I have my ordering word and phrase, and that goes uh, from at the beginning all the way through jobs. And then we have the author's last name, so I've got Steinbeck. Then we have a powerful verb, and I have introduces. And then we're going to put our first literary device or plot element or literary strategy. We're going to put that right in. And I have that right here. Steinbeck introduces Candy, a crippled old man, reluctantly allowing Carlson, another worker, to euthanize his geriatric sheepdog. And that right there is the literary element. So that I know is my what because I can tangibly point to that happening in the text. So what is going on in the text? Candy is allowing Carlson to euthanize his sheepdog. But now we need our why. Why is he doing that in relation to this idea? So it's going to be a violent scene, the euthanizing of the dog. But why? And that is in order to showcase how difficult it is to sacrifice the deep caring bond he has built with his pet. And notice that in the thesis, right, my in order to says, in order to showcase the deep care that the characters involved shared for one another, what I did in my topic sentence is I just clarified right here where it says to showcase the sacrifice, how difficult it was to sacrifice the deep caring bond that he, that's Candy, has with his pet. So now I've really focused in on the characters. But notice that I'm still talking about what's going on in the story because I've got Candy and I've got his pet. But I've now connected that to something a little bit more abstract. The difficulty of sacrifice, but also the deep care that they have for one another. So now that I have this, I've got a really strong topic sentence that's going to drive my paragraph. And it has all of the parts that show up in this template. Okay, so now what do I do that I have a strong topic sentence? Well, now I'm going to take, I'm going to provide the evidence, okay, for what I've listed first, which is what Steinbeck presents in the story, and that's Candy allowing Carlson to euthanize his dog. So when I write this evidence, I'm going to write take, for example, how, or I'm going to use some sort of introductory uh, example phrasing. So for instance, or for example, or take, for example, how. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a detailed summary of a little bit of what happened before and the actual event. And we want this to be between... Uh, four to six sentences, never more than six, never less than four. And when we write our textual evidence in, because we don't have the book in front of us, it's going to be a detailed plot summary of the events that we talked about in our topic sentence. So Candy allowing Carlson to euthanize his dog. And when I write a detailed plot summary here, I want to really focus on the verbs that I'm using, and I want to really focus on my adjectives and my adverbs. I want them to be precise. I don't want them to just say, I don't want to just say Candy, um, you know, gives Carlson his dog. I want to say reluctantly allows. That allows me to more accurately suggest my interpretation of what's going on in the text itself. So you're going to notice that I have take, for example, how, after, um, or take, for example, how, when. It doesn't matter, but the word after does allow us to provide a little bit more context. And we have that detailed summary and this summary is going to work as evidence when we don't have textual evidence in front of us. Anyway, so here's my example that would come after my topic sentence. And just really focus on the verbs that I have here. I'll try to see if I could circle some of them um, as we go through. So notice how it says, take for example how, when George and Lenny originally meet, okay, so we've got meet, uh, Candy, he's followed by his decrepit canine. Look at that, decrepit canine. I didn't just say followed by his dog. I said followed by his decrepit canine who not only moves slow, but has no teeth and smells foul. So notice a lot of these descriptors um, and these verbs that are strong here. In fact, the dog is consistently criticized by the other bunkmates due to his tangible stench and failing health. So notice I didn't just say, you know, the other bunkmates complain about him. I say he's consistently criticized, right? I'm really trying to be specific with my evidence here. 
to the point where many of them petition candy. Notice I didn't say ask candy. It says petition candy. Petition candy to put it out of its misery. Upon such a suggestion, Candy reminds his colleagues, look at that, he reminds, that means he's recollecting. He reminds his colleagues that the dog was such a great sheepdog in its prime. However, they challenge him to notice how the dog's current quality of life is only getting worse than it already is. Upon deep consideration and the offer of Carlson, Candy reservingly allows Carlson to shoot the dog in the back of the head so that it, as Carlton suggests, won't even feel it. And just look at the language that I have in here that's so rich in detail here, right? I don't just say uh, that Candy tells his colleagues that he was a good dog. I say that he reminds his colleagues of that, right? And then I don't say that co the colleagues then complain or the colleagues come back. I say they challenge him, right? And then we have Candy reservingly allows Carlson to shoot his dog, right? So Candy still didn't really want to do it, but he kind of realized that he should. Um, and as this happens, right, let's continue reading the uh, textual evidence here. As this happens, Candy slumps into his bed, devastated, and even later reflects that he should have been the one to mercifully put down his own dog. And you'll notice how all of my adjectives, adverbs, and verbs are so precise here and so rich. But the thing is that we call this textual evidence because every single element of what goes on in here is actually in the story. I can point to every single one of those events there. So I have not really provided any commentary at all. I've provided an analytical look at the textual evidence, but I haven't provided commentary for it yet. Okay? So what this means here is that now we've got a paragraph where we say, okay... Steinbeck presents Candy allowing his dog to be euthanized. Here's a detailed glimpse of where it's seen. Here's the picture itself as vividly as we could paint it with our language. And now we provide commentary. And what commentary needs to do is we need to explain how does all of what happens in here in our evidence actually showcase uh, a couple different ideas from our topic sentence. We need to talk about how difficulty is showcased, how sacrifice and difficult sacrifice is showcased, how care is showcased between Candy and his pet. So what that means is that we're going to look to provide commentary on how do these events that we just described showcase themselves as being difficult and sacrificial and caring at all of this here. Okay. Now, if you look at my template, what this actually says here is you want to summarize or identify exactly what you want to use that's found in the textual evidence. So you are going to go back to your textual evidence and actually pull it back down into your commentary and then you're going to choose, the ver uh, choose a verb. So you're going to summarize some language. You're going to choose a verb. Um, and you could choose one of these. Uh, the verb from the topic sentence demonstrates, shows, exposes, reveals, develops, uh, double exposes. I guess I use that one a lot. Uh, or elicits. And then you're going to insert the exact why that you have from your topic sentence. So you, one of these ideas. Okay, so we would say candy doing blank highlights the sacrifice that he made because... Okay, or, you know, Candy doing this showcases his care because. And so then what we'll do is once we pull in the why from the topic sentence, whichever one it relates to, the piece of evidence relates to, we're going to put the word because after it, and we're going to explain how the evidence reveals the idea from the topic sentence. And I promise you that when I go through this, it'll make way more sense. I'm just trying to outline the template for you. So we're going to explain how that textual evidence reveals that textual understanding. Um, and that's what we're driving towards here. And the word because is going to force you to do that. And this is always done in at least two sentences. And these explanations focus on kind of explaining assumptions uh, and word connotations um, that, that tie everything together. And you want to make sure that you also focus on your verb use down here as well, okay? And I know that the word because is, is bold-faced right here, but we want to use a lot of cause and effect language. So things like words like because, consequently, so, due to, since, seeing as though, all of that type of language suggests cause and effect and f can fill in for because. So we don't want to say because too often, but we want to convey that same idea because that creates logical relationships and it forces you to have commentary. Quick little rule of thumb, if you're trying to better your commentary, use the word because a little bit more often, and I bet that you'll actually get there. So let's look at this commentary here. 
And then I'll show you a color-coded version of this so that you can see how all this interconnects. So we have our commentary, right? We're going to pull straight down from our evidence and we're going to connect it to an idea in the topic sentence and then say because. So we have Candy mentioning the recollective merits of his sheepdog highlights, notice my verb there, highlights, the bond that he has to his pet because, and notice that this is the why that we're connecting it to right now, is this bond right here, okay, that bond, uh, that's our why. So this, him, him mentioning and re recollecting about his sheepdog highlights the bond that he has with his pet because though the pet's best days are behind it, Candy's willing to overlook its offensive faults, that would be its smell and whatnot, due to the positive circumstances that they shared. Essentially, all of the positive moments in the past make the dog worth having around in the present, even though that dog is sick. Although the dog would never have been able to relive such glory days, Candy has seemingly kept it around as long as he has due to the fact that if the dog were gone, perhaps those memories would die with it, right? And now this is showing the bond that they have. When the dog is there, he's got all of the memories of all of the good times that they've had and he wants to keep it around. Furthermore, the consistent relationship with the dog in the midst of the transient lifestyle Candy has, and that just means that he travels a lot from farm to farm, would have moved Candy to keep it around since individuals typically find comfort in the familiar and caring for this dog has been an emotional constant for Candy for many years. It has given him a sense of purpose and a relationship to rely on. And you'll notice that I bring in a little assumption there. Why would this actually um, showcase that, that relationship that they had? Because individuals typically find comfort in having those kind of things that they're familiar with around. The violent and sudden end of such, that would be his, the relationship with his pet, would have the potential to shock his sense of purpose, which Candy most likely questions anyway, seeing as though his handicap, he only has one hand, already limits his actual ability to be a productive member of the farm. However, in the midst of all of these thoughts, Candy is forced to realize that his reasons for keeping the dog are selfish in nature particularly because the dog is suffering and forcing bunkmates to suffer, those who are not as willing to overlook his terrible stench. Consequently, as Candy considers his loving relationship, he realizes that what is best for the dog's well-being relies heavily on him, Candy, sacrificing his desire for comfort and defined purpose. This sacrifice is hard for Candy, but knowing it's for the best and that he loves his dog, he agrees. And notice that now I'm talking about the agreement. How does that show the sacrifice here? Because he wants to keep him, but it's better for the dog, and he's putting the dog's interest before him. And then it says, though he does, not, though he does later recount his regret for not shooting his own dog, as he would have had closure, something all individuals desire. Notice some, um, oops, oops. Uh, notice that down here we again have a little, um, a little stereotype of, you know, um, what people commonly accept to be true, something all individuals desire, knowing that he not only made but enacted the final caring purposeful moment of their relationship. So why does he actually, um, you know, why would he have desired to do it himself later on when he reflects on it? Because he would have had a little bit more closure knowing that he had made that final act uh, that of caring for the dog um, as opposed to just some guy who didn't even care about him, who just wanted him dead because he thought he smelled bad. Now, this is another, this is the uh, paragraph all together here, and it's color-coded. Uh, I'm going to zoom out one just a little bit. There we go. Okay, and all I've done here is I've color-coded this by just showing you, I've got my verb from my template here, uh, Steinbeck introduces, and then I talk about um, the green here, which is exactly what I'm going to use as my textual evidence. So all of the green here is textual evidence, and the green in the commentary is when I refer back to stuff in the textual evidence, and then the pink here is the why in my topic sentence. And all of the pink in my commentary just shows you when I address those ideas of the why from the topic sentence. So you can actually see that I have evidence here. And then I connect that evidence consistently to the why in my commentary. And I've actually bold-faced all of the cause and effect language here. And that's how you actually want to write a really strong body paragraph. Uh, and these templates right here are here to help. If you scroll down, you've got your thesis template, your topic sentences, which actually provide a little variation. Uh, they still have a what and a why, but this allows you to provide variation if you'd like it. 
Um, and then we have our body paragraphing template right here, and we've got some chronological stems for those of you that would like those as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just grow a little bit again. So we'll shift me over to here. We'll get that off the page. Um, and if that video was helpful for you, I hope it was. If you need me to clarify anything, just put it in the comments down below. Um, as always, if it was helpful, once again, though, the best way to help the Garden of English is to actually press like and subscribe so that you don't miss me covering how to write conclusion paragraphs for a question three for AP Lit uh, or for literature in general, which we're going to do next. On top of that, you can support the Garden of English by buying some of our merch. Uh, it is right around the holiday season right now. You can buy some really cool Garden of English t-shirts on our website. You can also buy posters um, for your classrooms uh, if you're a teacher and whatnot. Um, and we actually are going to have some new posters going up pretty soon. Please feel free to follow us on Facebook and like us on Facebook. You can also follow us on Instagram and like us there. And, of course, you can also just share the video with friends. Uh, but if you have any questions, put it in the comments down below. You can actually access this entire document that I showed here today with templates and examples. That's also accessible in the description. And I look forward to seeing you, well, when we do conclusions probably next week. Have a great one.